I can't think of a better song to preface what we're getting ready to start talking about today and will for the next several weeks, the subject of prayer and the place that prayer ought to have in our life. Because when you think about what we just heard about Jehovah God, there's no God like Jehovah, and to realize that you and I have the wonderful, we've heard the word awesome a lot this morning, haven't we? Uh, we have the awesome privilege of going to Jehovah God through Jesus Christ and talking to Him as frequently, as regularly, as fervently as we desire to. He has opened the door to us to come to Him on a regular basis. And that's what we want to talk about today. So let's begin this sermon on prayer with prayer. Let's pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, wow, thank you so very, very much for this time in your house today with your family. And, and Father, we pray for your church worldwide. We pray, Father, not only for the, the, the small portion of your worldwide family that's gathered here in this place called Avalon, but for where Christians are gathered around this globe, uh, realizing that like in India and China that are hours ahead of us that Christians have already met, gathered around your table, partook of the Lord's Supper, have worshipped you. And, and uh, as we move across our great country, realize that in the hours to come that there will be other uh, faithful Christians that will meet. Father, what a great thing it is to be a part of that and to realize that, that your church uh, has been established for almost 2,000 years and that Jesus promised that the gates of, of hell, the gates of death, would not prevail against it. We have the great privilege of being a part of that. And so, Father, we praise you today, and I ask you that as we talk about prayer today and the next several weeks, that you would help us to see what a wonderful privilege it is to talk to you and to talk about the things of the kingdom and the things of our lives and to bring to you by way of petition the needs of our lives and to know that you're ready to answer, to grant the petitions of our hearts. God, us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to start today's message by asking three questions and, and asking you to give me a, a show of hands in response to those questions. How many of you would raise your hand and say yes to the question that, uh, that there is some aspect about my life, some aspect about your life that you would like to change? Some part of your, your habits, some part of your character. That, boy, your hands are going up already. It wasn't ready yet, but yeah. In other words, there's some change that you'd love to make. Some of you are really energetic about this this morning. Yeah. Some of you are holding your spices hand up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, but that looked pretty, pretty unanimous. Another question, how many of you would say that when it comes to change, some, some of those needed changes that came to your mind, that you, in your own ability and strength, are sometimes pretty weak about making those changes? Would, would you raise your hand? Okay, looks like most of us are, are still in agreement that we're on the, in the same boat there. Oh, one more question, how many of you would say that you believe with all of your heart that this awesome God that the choir just sang about has the ability, the power to bring those changes about in your life. Okay. Uh, what you just did is you displayed by the show of your hands uh, the, the wonderful privilege of prayer in our lives and why prayer is so necessary. Uh, just one verse for our text today found in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 11 and verse 1. It says, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. Well, you think about that. The disciples had had the opportunity to watch and to listen Jesus, uh, to Jesus preach the greatest sermons that had ever been or would ever be preached. And yet, nowhere in the four Gospels do you ever hear the disciples come to Jesus and say, Jesus, teach us public speaking. You know, teach us the ability, give to us the ability, teach us how to preach. Uh, through the years of ministry here on earth, the disciples had had the opportunity to, with their own eyes, witness the awesome power and, and the supernatural power of, of Jesus as he had healed people, lepers and the, the uh, blind and the lame, and even called forth the dead, uh, calling Lazarus from, forth from the tomb. And yet nowhere in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, do you ever hear the disciples come to, uh, to Jesus and say, Jesus, teach us to, to call the, the dead back to life. Teach us how to do these miracles. 
Uh, so there are so many things that, that when you think that they could have asked Jesus, why did they ask? Teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. I'm not sure I know the, the full answer to that question, but I think at least one thing was, the reason was that because they had seen him pray and they had seen the results of his prayer, it was what prompted them to say, teach us to pray. They saw him pray. They saw what happened. They, they saw that prayer was the life support system of, of this wonderful teacher, Jesus, that it was the key to his life. And friends, there's nothing more valid, there's nothing more, more vital to you in your Christian walk than your prayer life. And that's what I really want to stress in this t today's message and, and the messages for the next several weeks. But as we begin, I want to share with you that there are, there are a lot of misconceptions that people have about prayer. Is my thing going in and out? Yeah. Want to put me on the pulpit mic? Let me get it centered here. Okay, and I'll turn this one off. There are a lot of misconceptions about prayer, about how to pray, when to pray, why we pray. And, and I just want to share with you just real briefly what some of those misconceptions are. For example, I think some people look at prayer as a magic wand. Uh, you've all, you know, you know what a magic wand from our childhood uh, stories. Um, a, a magic wand is something you just sort of, wave at something and hope that something's going to, magic is going to happen. You know, it's a superstitious kind of approach. You wave it, and, and in this misconception, people just sort of see um, God is like that genie that you rub the bottle and poof, you know, and out comes the genie and he says, I will give you three wishes. Uh, and, and sometimes I think people see prayer as, as like that, as a, as a magic wand or a genie uh, in a bottle. Uh, secondly, uh, another misconception is that people think of prayer as a first aid kit. Uh, a first aid kit. You know, what, what, when do you use a first aid kit? When you're hurting. <laughs> you know, you've, you've cut yourself or you've smashed your thumb or uh, you need a Band-Aid or something more uh, substantial. And so sometimes people see prayer as just sort of, you know, it's a first aid kit. I've got prayer over here when I need it. Hope I don't need it too often, but it's sort of, sort of comforting to know that it's there. So like the man I read about came to his preacher one day, and the preacher said, I guess all we can do is pray. The deacon said, has it come to that? <laughs> <You know? laughs> is it that bad? You know, get the first aid kit. Um, so pre frequently, for us, prayer is the last thing. You do everything you can, and then if nothing else works, grab the first aid kit. Pray about it. Uh, misconception, bad misconception. Uh, a third one is that sometimes people see, I think, prayer, maybe never thought about it in these terms, but like a tug of war, a tug of war, you know, where you've got somebody on either end of the road, and, and we're on this one end, and we're just pulling, we say, God, this is what I need, this is what I want, God, you just don't understand, You're, man, I really need this, and you just keep pulling and pulling and pulling, and you just sort of picture God not really being in agreement with you, and he's pulling on the other end, and you're saying, but God, you don't understand, you know, here's what I need, please help me. Help me out of this predicament. Give me this or do this uh, for me. So it's a tug of war kind of thing. Oh, and then number four, maybe the worst misconception of all, and that's the misconception that prayer is a religious duty, a religious duty. And, and that's why I think we say things, and I've been guilty, I confess, uh, of saying things like, I know I should pray more. You know? I mean, what does that convey? Well, this is a duty that I have. I, and I really ought to pray. I know it's something that I ought to do. And if we get, we get this idea that if we don't pray, then we'll automatically be on God's bad list. You know? uh, and as a result, if we're not careful, if that's solely the way you look at prayer, then we will fall into prayer becoming a meaning, meaningless ritual. Um, we say, well, oh, you know, the day's almost over and I haven't prayed. I really ought to pray. Let me pray and then check that off of my spiritual to-do list. And I know God is really happy with me because I've done my spiritual duty and I prayed. No, no, no. That's not the way we should think about prayer. Listen, if prayer is a duty for you, you have missed the total point of prayer. So those are some misconceptions. So, you know, what's the real deal then? Uh, and, and that's really what I want to share with you today. There are, there are at least four, I'm sure there are more, but there are four purposes of prayer that the Bible really makes clear. And I think, that, and, and um, 
as we work our way through these four today, and I'm saving the best for the last one. I love the last one. I'm going to get you real excited about it, looking to it, uh, toward it. Uh, but if we, have, if we get the biblical uh, approach of what, what prayer is all about and how God sees prayer in our lives, I think it will excite us more uh, about praying and, uh, and help us in, in our prayer of commitment. So what, what are the four purposes, that we, at least four, that we see from Scripture? Number one, prayer is a declaration of dependence. Prayer is a declaration of dependence. Now notice I didn't say independence. It is a declaration of dependence. Uh, and there are a number of scriptures that would indicate that, but just, let me just call your attention to John chapter 15. In fact, if you have your Bibles, you might want to open to John 15. We're going to look at several verses that right in that neighborhood of the Gospel of John. But in J chapter 15, Jesus uses his figurative speech to talk about or illustrate the relationship that we, his disciples, his followers, have to him. And in verse 5, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. So picture this. Jesus is the, is the, the, the main trunk there, and, and we are attached to him in a, in a figurative way. And so he says, if a man remains in me, that is attached to me, and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Here's what I really want you to see. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. Remember that. Apart from me, Jesus says, you can do nothing. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying, separated from me, you can't produce a thing. And so prayer is when I declare that I understand that. And, and I say to God, God, I understand that I am totally reliant upon you. And, and, and I confess that I need you. I need you in my life. I need to be connected to you through Jesus Christ. You see, this is sort of a, you might say a judgmental statement when I say that I don't think most Christians believe that. You say, well, why, Jimmy, why are you expressing such doubt? Because I see how we live so independently, so self-reliant, so ready to go it on our own, in our own strength, in our own power. Been there, done that. You have too, you know, where we just say, man, let me, let me, with all of my power, with all of my knowledge, with all of my intellect, with everything that I have within me, try to solve this problem. And after so long a time of trying to do that, I say, God, now, would you help me? You know, first aid kit uh, approach to prayer. Well, wouldn't it be better to just from the very beginning to recognize the truth of what Jesus is saying in this, in this verse and say, God, I, I see that. And I understand, and we, we've, we've sung about it this morning, our God is an awesome God. And, and, and if we really believe it like we were singing it, and that was great singing this morning, and if we really believe that, wouldn't it just make good sense that we'd start every day saying, God, you are an awesome God, and I just want you to know I really need you today. Whatever it is that I've got on my to-do list today, my agenda for today, I need you. And, and I know that you want to be there with me. And I know that you want that relationship and that connection. And, and so, God, I, I just confess my dependence upon you. You see, our biggest problem is that we can, is that so often we feel like, I can make it on my own. And we don't realize how much we need God. And the Bible is full of examples of people who have fallen flat on their face because they were living on their own power, their own ability, ability their own intellect, their own strength, we could talk about Adam and Eve who vastly overestimated their own ability, result driven out of the garden, lost their de close daily communion with God. Or how about King David? Uh, when you think about King David, usually the first thing that pops in our, in our mind is Bathsheba. I mean, there are a lot of things about David to remember, but we think about Bathsheba. What do you think would have happened if when David looked across the rooftop and saw Bathsheba, if instantly, immediately he had dropped on his knees to, and, and prayer to God and said, God, I need you. I need your strength right now to overcome this temptation that I am facing. You see, the outcome of that story would have been so vastly different. We probably wouldn't have even known about it because it wouldn't have been recorded in, in, in the scripture. It would have just been another brief moment of temptation in David's life if he had totally relied upon God in that moment. Or how about Samson? You remember Samson, don't you? Samson became a man of prayer right at the last. 
but it was only after he had realized that his power came from God and that he himself was totally incapable of using that power to please God as long as he was doing his own thing. And so he finally prayed. King Saul lost his kingdom because he was so self-reliant, proud of his own power. And the list goes on in the Bible. And the list goes on throughout the years of people failing because we are just so self-reliant. Prayer is our daily opportunity to say, God, I need you. I need you. And it may be that one reason that more people don't pray is because you have to be honest enough with God to say, I can't make it on my own. I am weak. I am unable to, to, to be successful in living a Christian life and be the dad that I want to be, the wife that I want to be, the husband I want to be, the parent that I want to be. Without your help, I can't do it. And it takes a person of humility to make that admission before God. But it is the wisest thing you could ever do is to start every day saying, God, without your help, I won't make it today. God, with, there's nothing that's going to come into my life today, but what with your help, we'll be able to take care of. But God, I need you. I need you. So first of all, prayer is a declaration of dependence upon God. Secondly, the Bible tells us that prayer is an act of communication. It's an act of communication. John 15, again, uh, Jesus talking to his disciples. Look at what he said in verse 15. Jesus said, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You see what Jesus is saying? He's saying, look, I want you to have the proper concept of the relationship, the connection that you and I have. And remember who Jesus was and is. He's God's son. He's deity who's come to earth in the flesh and spends some time here on earth and, and spends a lot of time with guys like Peter and James and John and Andrew and, and a lot of others during the time he was here. And Jesus says that the reason that we can ask anything in prayer is because we're friends. Because we're friends. Isn't that amazing? God says, I don't treat you like servants. Now, now, the Bible tells us that we are to be servants, that we to have servant hearts as we relate to each other. But he's saying, I'm not going to treat you like slaves. I'm going to treat you like friends. And we fail to realize what a wonderful, wonderful privilege it is to have this kind of daily relationship with God. Let me illustrate. Suppose you were told by one of President Bush's uh, personal aides that tomorrow morning it has been arranged, if you'd like to, that you can go to D.C., and have a 30-minute personal conversation with the President of the United States. And, and, and this aide would say to you, and I'm going to pretend I'm the person, okay? And this aide would say to me, Jimmy, nothing is off limits. In fact, he has even said that if you wanted to, you can call him George. You know, it's not, none of this, Mr. President. That, and and, and he, he wants you to know that when you have that 30 minutes, in fact, he'll, ex, he'll extend it and, and all and that nothing is off limits. You can talk to him about anything. You can ask him any question you want to ask him. You can give him suggestions about how to run this country if you want to. Yeah. Uh, but you're going to have this personal time with the president. I don't know about you. I would jump at that opportunity. If it was tomorrow morning, I'd say to you, I wouldn't, I'm not going to see you in church tonight. Hope you'll be here. But I'm going to be on my way to D.C. And because I want to get a good night's rest. And I want to give this a lot of thought. And I'm probably going to take a piece of paper and a pen. I'm going to jot down a lot of notes, things that I really want to make sure I talk to George about uh, tomorrow. Uh, oh, what a great opportunity that would be. Wouldn't you lo love to have that, to get to talk to the, the key man in this entire country, to get to talk to him? Well, guess what? We have a greater invitation than that. Did you know that? A greater invitation than that. We're invited to converse with the Creator. We're invited to talk with the one who is in charge of all that there is. I love what somebody said. You don't have to talk to the key people here on earth if you're friends with the one who holds the keys. Isn't that great? And, and we're, the, we're friends. You, have a, you, you, are, you are a friend to the one who holds the keys. And he has said, come talk to me anytime you want to. You don't have to have an appointment. You don't have to call and see if it's okay, if you're interrupting anything. But you can just come talk to me. Wow. 
That's what prayer is. God says, I'm the King of kings, Lord of lords, and you're my friend. Let's talk. That's what prayer is. And, and, you know, I think part of our problem is that we really, to be honest, have a hard time believing that God is really interested in us. What do you think? I mean, the God who, I mean, there are six billion people on the face of this earth. And the God who's in charge of, of this earth and this universe and keeping the, the solar system going, it, it, we can't conceive that this God is interested in car payments you know? or an algebra test that I've got tomorrow or a, a communication problem with my spouse or the guy at work who just irritates the life out of me and I hate going there to work every day and communicating with him. Would God be interested in that? Or that, that I have a recurring back problem. You know? does, does God really care? And the answer, according to the scriptures, is yeah, he cares. He cares about all of those things. And, then, and even things that, we, that may, in our category, seem to be even more trivial. And, and some of you could share today, and I, I wish I had time to just go into this point more, but I, I don't. But you could share about the personal things that you've gone to God and talked to about. And he's heard and he's answered your, your prayers. Why? Because he's your friend. He's your friend. So prayer is a declaration of dependence on God and his power. And it is an act of communicating with him because he's our friend. Is prayer taking on a different light for you? I hope it is this morning. Let's look at number three. Number three, prayer is an act of supplication. It's an act of supplication or request. You know, there are many, many wonderful promises found throughout the Word of God that apply to us as, as the followers of Christ. For example, in the Old Testament, Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord. And I like this second part. He will give you the desires of your heart. Isn't that great? He will give you the desire, not, doesn't say the needs, the, the desires of your heart. Why does he want to do that? Because he's our friend. It goes back to the, next, to the previous point. Uh, Psalm 84, 11. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. Look, how about this? No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. Now, blameless doesn't mean absolute sinless perfection there, but it's just that does indicate that we're striving to walk in his will and in his favor. And if we're doing that, then he loves to, to give us those good things. No good thing does he withhold. A lot of passages like that sprinkled throughout the Old Testament, especially through the book of Psalms and Proverbs. But how about the New Testament? Philippians 4.19. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. That's a pretty nifty promise, isn't it? I mean, think about having that kind of bank. Yeah. My God will meet all of your needs. But, but the fact of the matter is that, get this, prayer is God's chosen method of meeting your needs. And if, you don't want to miss this point. Prayer is God's chosen method of meeting your needs. Uh, the Bible teaches there, us that there are some things that God has promised to do, but only if we pray. Some people think, hey, God already knows. God is omniscient, knows everything that there is, so he, he already knows everything that I need, so I don't need to ask. He'll just give it when I need it. No, 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 no. That's not what the Bible teaches. In fact, James says in his epistle, you have not because you ask not. You ask not. Over 20 times in the New Testament, the Bible says ask, ask, ask. Keep on asking. There's a fictitious story, and I emphasize fictitious, okay, that carries a great lesson. It's about a guy who died and went to heaven. And all over heaven are these huge warehouses inside of which were tremendous gifts, these big warehouses, and every time when he'd go in, there was a gift stacked to the ceiling, wrapped in pretty paper. And, uh, and these gifts were things, fantastic things, like happy families, special spiritual blessings, peace and contentment, just all kinds of, of neat gifts. And the guy says to the Lord, said, Lord, where are all these gifts? And Jesus said, well, look for yourself. There's a tag attached to every gift. And so the guys went over and looked at away from the mic yeah <laughs> uh, look looked at the tag and it said never ask for and he turned to another big box and looked at the tag and said never ask for a uh, third one never and, and he realized 
same thing attached to every gift there. Never ask for. Never ask for. Never ask for. Never ask for. So do you, do you see what that story is, is teaching us? That there are so many good things that God has for his people. And we ought to be asking. We ought to be asking. Why? Because he takes great delight in giving those things to us. He, he's, a, he's a generous, generous father who wants to give us so many good things. But so many of those things he said, don't ask, you don't get. Why? Because he wants us to be friends and depend on him and rely on him. C.H. Spurgeon once said, God never shuts his storehouses until you shut your mouth. <laughs> Jesus, in talking to the apostles in John again, John chapter 16 said, ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. Your joy will be complete. Based on what? You're asking and God giving. You're receiving these, these gifts that are in those big warehouses up there with your name on it, but could, could have attached. Never ask for. Never ask for. And so prayer is an act of supplication, asking God for the spiritual blessings that he so desperately wants to pour into our lives. It brings us to number four, my favorite. Number four, prayer is an act of cooperation. Prayer is an act of cooperation. I think, to me, this is one of the most exciting aspects of prayer, that it's an act of teamwork. And I've, I've said, I know I've said this numerous times before, but as I was working on this and thinking about this, this particular principle, I thought to myself, Jimmy, you probably ought to say this every Sunday from the pulpit until it gets to the point where people have said, oh, no, here it comes again. Yeah. You say, well, what is it you're talking about? This, this, this biblical teaching that next to having our sins forgiven and being and headed to heaven for eternity. Do you know the greatest thing about being a Christian? In case you don't, let me tell you again. It's that God has sovereignly chosen in his plan to use us, to use you and to use me as his partners in the greatest work on the face of the earth, that of telling people the overwhelmingly good news that they don't have to go to hell when they leave this earth, but that our loving creator has prepared a wonderful place called heaven, and he desperately wants every one of us to come there. He has chosen you, and you, and you, me. He, he has said, Jimmy, I want you to work with me in this task of getting the message out to as many people as we possibly can. Wow. I mean, it's great to be a Christian and have my sins forgiven. It's great to realize that when my life here on earth comes to an end, I'm going to go to heaven. But in the meantime, in the course of my life, in the process of my living out the, the years of my life here on earth, I get to partner with God. And you do too. He's called every one of us, not just preachers, but he's called every one of us. To, and, and he said, would you work with me to get this job done? Now, you see, it wouldn't have to be that way. In fact, I got to thinking when I was working on this about biblical examples of, of what I'm talking about, and there are so many, but let me just share three from the book of Acts real quick. In Acts chapter 10, you remember Cornelius? Cornelius was a Gentile who believed in God. And so God, get this, God sent an angel to Cornelius, and that angel said specifically, I mean, he spoke to him. The angel speaking to Cornelius said, Send to Joppa for Simon, who's called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. And so the Bible says Cornelius sent two men to 30, 30 miles or so to Joppa, more than a day's journey walking, to get Peter. And then Peter, the next day, returns the 30 miles and goes into Cornelius' household to tell him what he needs to do in order to be saved. Now, I read that and I think, wouldn't it have been a lot easier for God's angel to, since he was already talking to Cornelius, to say, Cornelius, you need to be baptized. And why do you need Simon Peter? So hang on to that for a moment. Acts chapter 8, we read about another angel. This one went to Philip and told Philip, go down to a desert road where he met up with a man from Ethiopia and shared the gospel with him and baptized him into Christ. Question, couldn't the angel have just cut Philip out of the equation? And instead of the angel going to Philip, the angel go to the Ethiopian man and tell him, uh, find somebody to baptize you so that you can become a Christian. 
another one. Acts chapter 9, Saul, who we later, become, uh, later know as Paul, struck down by the Lord on the way to Damascus with a bright light from heaven. Right there, Saul said, what shall I do, Lord? Now, keep in mind, Jesus is already in conversation with this guy. And uh, he's already engaged. I mean, couldn't Jesus have, have just said, arise and be baptized and wash your sins away, calling on my name? But he didn't. He told Saul to get up and go into Damascus. And then the Lord spoke to another guy named Ananias and told Ananias to go tell Saul to be baptized. Uh, so three chapters, three times, God used men, Peter, Philip, and Ananias, to do what God could have done himself. God could have just carried all of that out. He could today. He could just go to India and China and Thailand and just tap people on the head and say, by the way, did you know I love you enough that I sent my son Jesus into the world? If you want to become a Christian, I'd love to have you as part of my family. God could do that, but he chose not to. In 1 Corinthians 3, 9, Paul says just three powerful words. We are called God's fellow workers. We are working with God. Well, what am I saying? I am saying that God has chosen to use his people, that's us, to tell the message of salvation. We are in a joint business with God. And a very important part of the way this business is, works is called prayer. Prayer. Prayer is God's program. Prayer is God's way of doing things. Prayer is God's way of operating. Prayer is God saying, I have chosen to limit myself to what I accomplish on earth simply by limiting myself to the faith and prayers of my children on the earth, what they believe me for, I will do. We talk about, you know, the, so, such huge segments of the earth's population today that don't know Jesus as Christ. Is that God's fault? Mm, no. That's church's fault. I'm not just talking about us, but I'm talking about Christians through the ages who've dropped the ball and who failed to realize the awesome responsibility of being partners with God in the work of God's kingdom. One of the most amazing verses in all the Bible is found in John 14, 12, where Jesus, talking to the disciples, said, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. And then this, this, this just sort of blows your way. He said, he will do even greater things than these, because I'm going to the Father. Jesus is saying to the disciples, you, the disciples, and then and down through the ages, all of us as Christians, that, that we can do greater things than Jesus did? You just want to go back, whoa, 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 no, 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 no. That must, that's got to be a misprint. I mean, look at all the things that Jesus did. So how is it possible to do greater things than Jesus? The answer is simple. Prayer. That's it. Prayer. It's, I mean, think through this. When Jesus was here on earth, he voluntarily limited himself in becoming a human. Therefore, he could be only be in one place at one time. He was limited by space and time. He could not be in the past, the present, and the future at the same time. He was limited to do the miracles that he did within the vicinity of where he was at that particular time. But now, he says, I'm going to the Father. In other words, he's gone. He's gone back to heaven. But before he left, in the very next verse here in John chapter 14, he, when he, right after he said he will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father, then he said, and I will do whatever you ask in my name. Do you get the connection? Prayer connected to us doing greater things than Jesus? Because why? Because prayer is not limited by space and time. You can pray, it's like sending a missile, a good, good kind of missile. You know? Not with a nuclear warhead, but, it, but it's with God's blessings on that missile. I could pray, you could pray for somebody in San Diego. It's like sending a missile directly to that guy's home in San Diego and you never leave Virginia Beach. Wow, that's power, isn't it? Nearly every Saturday, I spend several minutes praying for the Christians in India, especially because they're going through such persecution right now. And uh, as you know, when Shelby and I went to India and came back, we left part of ourselves there. Oh. So I've just got a reminder on my computer that reminds me that ten and a half hours before the Lord's Day starts in India, I pray for that part of God's kingdom. And you know, when I'm doing that, she, Shelby could call and say, Jimmy, what are you doing? And I could truthfully say, nothing much. I've just been in India for the last ten minutes. Um, 
I've just been talking to the senior partner of this enterprise called God's Kingdom, asking him to protect some of our co-workers over there in India. You get that? We're partners. We're partners with God. And prayer is just our communication about the work of this business. Prayer can penetrate into places we can't go. Prayer is limitless in its power. People can reject our appeals, our arguments. They can reject us as a person. But they're totally defenseless against our prayers. Proverbs 21 one says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. The king's heart. What king? Christian kings? Not necessarily. Every king. Christian king, pagan king, atheistic king, terrible king. Tyrannical king, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. And then he says he directs it like a water course wherever he pleases. There are several biblical examples of that. One found in the book of Ezra. I love this passage where it says, For seven days they, the Jews, celebrated with joy the feast of unleavened bread. Why? Because the Lord had filled them with joy. Where did joy come from? Because God had changed the attitude of the king of Assyria so that he assisted them in the work on the house of God the God of Israel. I don't know about you, but I see a little humor in that verse. It's a humor? Where is the humor? Here's a king, the king of Assyria, not God's chosen people, not a worshiper of God. And yet he's helping the Jews to work on the house of God. Where I see the humor is I just sort of see the king, just picture this king one day saying, why am I doing this? Yeah. I don't even like these people. Yeah. I don't believe in their God. And here I am helping them build a house of worship to their God. Why? Uh, the truth is, he was doing that because God said, you're going to do that. Because he changes the course of lives like changing the course of rivers to accomplish his purpose. And his people had obviously been praying to him about that work. So like a river, God can change the course of history by the prayers of his people. And that's the reason I'll finally get to the title of this message. First, I called it, Moving the Hand That Moves the World. But then I thought, it's more personal than that. It's moving the hand of the one who moves your world. That's what prayer is. It's moving the hand that moves your world and my world. And for the next several weeks, we're going to be talking more about prayer. And I pray that you'll pray with me that Avalon will be a praying church. Because a praying church is a holy church. A praying church is an enthusiastic church. A praying church is a church that sees God act in the life of the congregation as well as in individual lives. A praying church is a happy church because when you pray and you get answers, your life is full of joy. There's nothing more fun than seeing answers to prayer. But we've got to pray first. So as we close today, let me ask you, what are you lacking in your life right now simply because you fail to ask God for it? That's just it. You've not asked God for it. Maybe a change in some particular area of your life needs to take place. And you just need to say, God, I rely on you because without you, I am nothing. Without you, I can't do it. Because he says, ask and just keep on asking. Keep on asking. Let me encourage you to plan to be here for each of these sermons on prayer and pray for these messages and for our hearts to be open. And God will use them to help us become a church full of prayer. Faithful prayers. Why? Because we realize what prayer is. It's not a first aid kit. It's not a magic wand. It's not a religious duty. But these things that we've talked about today just put it on a different level, don't they? 